So it's uh, 5.01 p.m. on Tuesday, September 9th. We're called to order. And at this time, uh, I'll do a roll call of council members present for our meeting. I believe uh, council member Deckard won't be able to join the meeting until a little bit later. So we'll look forward to seeing Mr. Deckard uh, a bit later tonight. Uh, okay, so council members, please unmute your microphones as I call the roll and indicate by voice that you are present. Council member Deckard. For the moment is not present. Council member Hawk. Present. Council member Iverson. Present. Council member McKim. Here. Council member Munson. Here. And council member Wilkes. Present. Okay. It's noted that we have a quorum present and we'll proceed with our agenda. So uh, for members of the public who are interested, the agenda we're working from tonight is published <laughs> on the Monroe County government website. Tonight marks the first of five budget work sessions that we'll be holding throughout uh, this week and next. And as a quick overview for our guests joining us this evening, we'll be hearing a 2022 budget request from the following offices and departments. First, we'll hold binding reviews of budget requests submitted by the Monroe Fire Protection District, as well as the Solid Waste Management District. <clears throat> then we'll move on to budget requests submitted by the Clerk's Office, the Treasurer's Office, the Coroner's Office, the Recorder's Office, the Surveyor's Office, uh, the Parks and Recreations Department will wrap up uh, with the budget request from Extension Services. So we really do have an evening here that's just chock full of fiscal fun. And I know that uh, council members are all familiar with our budget work session procedures. And I have no plans to deviate from how we've done this in prior years. But just as a reminder for everyone that uh, the intent for these budget work sessions over the next week uh, are for council uh, to accept, review, and discuss each of the 2022 budget requests that have been presented for our approval. These budget requests have all been published to the Monroe County Council webpage uh, that can be accessed from the Monroe County government website. And for anyone who may want to visit the council page to examine the 2022 budget requests, you can do that by clicking the link labeled View Monroe County Budget Information. <laughs> that's located right there in the middle of the page. And it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, there's some really fantastic information on that page that outlines our entire budget process from start to finish. And it's written in a way that's uh, very easy to follow and understand. And most importantly, there's some great information included there about how the public can get involved in the budget process as well. And we always wanna make sure that this is a very transparent process. It has many opportunities for public engagement. It's also uh, important to note that these budget work session meetings that we're holding over the next several days do not represent the... I'm sorry, uh, TSD, we're getting some feedback from your feed. I am very sorry about that. It's also important to note that these budget work session meetings that we're holding over the next several days do not represent the final approval of the 2022 Monroe County annual budget, nor do any of these meetings constitute our required formal budget hearing. The official uh, public hearing for the 2022 Monroe County budget will actually be held on Tuesday, October 4th at 5.30 p.m., which incidentally, I'm very much looking forward to. This is kind of like the stars have aligned in my favor here because I can think of no better, more delightful way to celebrate my 40th birthday on October 4th. So I'll be really looking forward to that meeting. And that final budget adoption will occur on October 18th and uh, 19th. Uh, I also wanna note that the public will have several opportunities to comment on the 2022 budget prior to adoption including at the public hearing on October 4th and at first reading of the budget ordinance on October 18th and at final adoption on October 19th. All three of these meetings will take place at 5.30 p.m. on their respective dates. Uh, okay, so uh, let me just check in with staff here, Ms. Shell and uh, Ms. Rice. Did I miss anything on procedures that I need to cover? I'll have a little bit more uh, on that here as we get into uh, the actual budget request, but hopefully that got everything covered that we needed. 
And before we get into our budget discussions, um, we'll first have an update on revenues and expenditures from Council Member McKim. Mr. McKim, are you ready to present? Uh, sure. Let me uh, uh, share my screen. I'm going to go. Uh, this this will not take very long at all because we really haven't seen uh, we haven't had very many changes since uh, the last the last time we presented it. So this is just I'm not going to go through the entire 4B again. Uh, however, I do anticipate that we will be updating this document uh, each you know at the end of each night as we make. Uh, if we make changes to any of the departmental submissions through votes here, we'll be making changes to this. So again, this this kind of shows us the big the big picture. Uh, the bottom line for our uh, our frozen levy, uh, general fund election health aviation reassessment in Cune Bridge, is about eight hundred forty one thousand dollars in uh, in budgeted uh, requests above budgeted revenues or planned revenues. Uh, the public safety local income tax is about $546,000 in budgeted uh, revenues or, or budgeted expenditures over budgeted revenues. Uh, on the other hand, the, uh, the, the special purpose lit is uh, budgeted in right now uh, in surplus in $443,000 in budgeted uh, revenues over over expenditures again uh and then so that that's kind of the this year that's sort of the you call that the current uh the current year uh then what, what we see where our operating balances are and one of the things that we see is that we are uh substantial we, we've shifted funding uh these levies substantially in favor of the general fund this year probably we'll have to make some tweaks to go in the other direction because we have several fund balances that'll be that'll be lower than they need to be. In fact, the election fund, if we accept the budget as presented, will actually be negative. Um, so we we would certainly need to shift levy from the general fund to the election fund to uh, bring us back into into balance there. Um, public safety uh, will note that actually we'll note that both the general fund and public safety fund. Despite being, uh, you know, being budgeted in uh, uh, overall in uh, uh, in deficit, still show fairly substantial and generous uh, operating balances. So we still do have enough cushion there. And the other thing I'll leave everybody with is that we this, of course, does not include any cost of living adjustments or any uh, additional progress that we would like to make towards implementing the WISP plan, the Wagner Irwin Shealy compensation uh, plan. And as we talked about last month uh, or last meeting, we have kind of earmarked, informally earmarked a million dollars to put towards uh, making progress uh, towards the WISP recommendations, which is more than 50% of the uh, of their recommendations. And Michelle may want to talk at some point about uh, how those numbers are actually represented in, in budgets, but um, I'll kind of, I think I'll leave it, uh, leave it from here. And we may want to come back to that when we start talking about the county budgets. I know we have the fire district and solid waste districts first. So does anybody have any questions, I guess, about the, uh, the, the four Bs before we move any further? Like I said, these, these documents are in your Dropbox and they will be, you know, we'll, we'll make sure. And I, Michelle's been really good about keeping them uh, up to date as we, you know, as any changes are made. Do we have any, any questions uh, on, on any of this? I think also just to note um, in case um, there's anyone in the public who may be curious uh, and, and wasn't at our last meeting when we discussed this, uh, the ARPA allocation that uh, the county has received the 28 million or so. Uh, that's a totally yeah. separate process from uh, what we'll be discussing over the next several days in these budget hearings. Uh, that, that's a, 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 di a different appropriation process that we'll be uh, conducting separately from the uh, from the county budget process here. Any other questions or comments? Okay. And Michelle, did you have any anything to add? Not at this time. Okay. Well, very good. And Mr. Kim, is that that take care of your 
uh, material there? Yeah, I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't think I want to repeat we had a pretty, what we've already done. So, yeah, yeah, yeah we had on. a pretty thorough discussion at the last meeting about that, but thanks again for, um, for the update there. Okay, so we will now move on to um, item four, and we'll initiate our budget discussions for the evening. Uh, to begin these discussions, each department uh, will be invited to present their request for us on Zoom. As I mentioned before, the uh, budget name, fund numbers, and category request totals will all be read into the record. Departments will be given the opportunity to explain any increases or decreases or additions to their budget that they're seeking. Uh, council will be given an opportunity uh, to ask questions of elected officials and department heads. Council will also have the opportunity to make any recommendations to adjust account lines based on the discussion and needs of departments. Uh, the council will then take a preliminary vote to pre-approve each department's budget requests. Again, this is not the final approval of the budget that will occur uh, later next month. Okay, so first up tonight is the Monroe Fire Protection District. Council, I move to open for discussion and review fund 8603 Monroe Fire Protection Special Fire for 11 million 20, ooh, I'm already messing up, $11,028,248 in the personnel category, $438,000 in the supplies category, $976,500 in the services category, zero in capital for a total budget of $12,442,748. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. And uh, Chief Dustin Dillard is joining us as well as Mark Cruzan. Welcome. And Chief Dillard, your microphone is muted. Am I good to go? Yeah, all set. Okay, so just in keeping with um, the practice that I've held at these meetings the last couple of years with these mergers, the first things I want to point out um, are that the 2019 or the 2018, 2019, and 2020 actuals reflect the previous district footprint. Uh, 2019 and 2020 do include Indian Creek, but as you know, January 1 of this year, we had a massive merger with Bloomington and Van Buren townships, and those are not reflected in the actual actuals. So if you look at those numbers, there's this huge difference and it's kind of confusing. Uh, so just wanted to clarify that. Uh, second, um, you know, Washington Township is currently funding a fire station there in the process to begin construction. And I think they're in planning and zoning right now, uh, but that project is underway. And that has a lot to do with some of the stuff I'll talk about this evening. Um, the, the mergers that are occurring this year are not nearly as massive uh, as what took place in this calendar year. Uh, so 2022, there are some changes, but not near as drastic as the changes that we saw this year. Um, we do have a need for six additional firefighters to staff that station in Washington Township. And we're also going to be assuming uh, the responsibility for utilities and upkeep in that new station, as well as the station in Benton Township. Now the staffing that is at Benton Township is currently included in the current budget but we do have a lot of responsibilities to assume there as well, fuel for vehicles, maintenance on vehicles and whatnot. So really we're looking at adding six people, one additional station um, staffing wise, but we're looking at adding two stations operationally. Um, just some information for folks out there, the district currently serves about 45,000 citizens in Monroe County, um, almost 20,000 housing units and we cover 317 square miles of Monroe County, which is 77%. So the fire district geographically makes up a large area of Monroe County's fire protection. Um, the roots of this budget date back uh, really as far as 2017, um, when we started the process of merging Indian Creek Township in. Um, and one of the nice things has been, um, as we've made these forecasts, you know, several years in advance, um, our actual costs have come back better. 
uh, each time. Um, when we presented to Benton and Washington Township, uh, we presented a budget that was about $14.5 million. Uh, the budget tonight that will actually implement that merger is $2.1 million under that amount. So, you know, there's, there's been a lot of, of work put into this. Uh, getting into the budget, um, I'm just going to run through some of the category lines real quick. Um, not necessarily the dollar amounts themselves, but actually what, what the changes are to them. So this budget includes a cost of living adjustment at 3%. Uh, you'll notice there's a new training captain line. Um, this basically represents a repurposing of the 2021 second fire marshal. We had, so we had two fire marshals budgeted for 2021, but we very rapidly realized uh, that with all of the additional staffing, uh, we had some really good training opportunities presented, but we needed some additional staffing to run that department. And that's something that we're really, really proud of. Um, so you'll notice that the fire marshal line this year uh, includes one individual and there's a new line that says training captain. And just to give our, uh, our training division some uh, props, as of this August 31st of this year, they've completed 27,100 hours of training. That's a 156 person roster averaging 173 hours this year. We've already reached 90% of our annual goal in just the first eight months. So those folks are doing some phenomenal things. Um, our full-time and part-time firefighter categories, um, there are 14 full-time 1977 fund firefighters um, included. Um, these are positions that were funded 100% by an assistance to firefighters grant program. If you'll recall last year, mid-budget season, we received that grant, so it wasn't included in our 2021 budget, but we've included it this year as a miscellaneous revenue source and you'll see additional 14 full-time firefighters in that 1977 fund line just for the grant. Um, these positions will be fully funded 100%. That's pay and benefits uh, through the spring of 2024. Uh, we do include in this six additional full-time firefighters to staff that Washington Township Fire Station, uh, but you'll also see a reduction of 12 fewer part-time firefighters, their full-time firefighter equivalent positions due to those 14 positions that uh, the, the grant picked up. Uh, we have had a lot of um, overtime this year based on folks taking things off and doing lots of training. So we didn't reduce the part-time positions, uh, the complete 14 amount, because we want to utilize some of those positions to float around and fill those in to save us on overtime costs. Um, the six firefighters that were adding to Washington Township um, directly affect a few other lines, and you're gonna see increases in those lines based off the addition of six personnel. That includes incentive qualifications. Um, the officer pay line will have one new captain and two new lieutenants for the Washington Township station. Uh, there'll be an increase in the substitute emergency overtime line, which also includes training and special events now. Um, uniform allowance for six additional people a health insurance for six additional career members, and then a larger amount in the PERF 1977 fund employer contribution, as well as life insurance. Uh, the special event pay line, uh, we actually moved this into the substitute emergency overtime and training line. Um, when our bookkeeping is done at the accounting office, a lot of that stuff's paid um, at those overtime rates. So it's best if we just put that in that line so that our actuals that we present you are um, more defined. Um, holiday pay is pretty simple. It's calculated to have 30 members on duty for each of the district approved holidays, which there are 10. Our administrative assistants still have two, uh, but one thing that I really wanna point out is uh, in our discussions for the 2021 budget, we discussed the job description that we had put together for these positions coming into 2021. And we felt like those positions aligned with the PAT4 category in Monroe County government. Um, now we're eight months, in, eight months in, and they've been performing at these actual duties, and these positions clearly are more aligned with a PAT5 category. So you'll see that change in those lines, and there's a pay increase there to, to more uh, comparably align with the PAT5. 
Uh, trustee compensation includes an increase uh, for two additional members to come in in January of 2022. Uh, those members will represent Benton and Washington Township. Um, the 77 fund now has a total of 63 members in that. Uh, that includes 14 folks from the AFG fu um, funded positions, and then it includes 14 previous members of Van Buren Fire Department or Northern Monroe Fire Territory who transferred into the 77 fund. The reason I want to highlight this is when we pay someone's PERF, the amount that is paid into the pension is based on every dollar earned. In the 77 fund, there's a certified base salary. That's $60,000 currently. It's going to go up to 61. I don't have the number right in front of me. And then $3,000 for longevity. We only pay pension benefits based on that lesser amount. Whereas someone could come in and work a lot of overtime, have a lot of extra incentive pay, a lot of extra officer pay, and we would be paying more into pensions for that. The 77 fund pension is actually offers more benefits but there's a consistency in how we budget for those amounts. So really good to see 14 folks move into that at the beginning of this year. Uh, 23 employees are in the PER fund, the regular PER fund. This includes chief officers and firefighters who were previously in the regular PER fund at Northern Monroe Fire Territory or Van Buren and remained in that fund when they transferred in as well as our administrative personnel. In the medical services line, it's based on a quote we received for services this year, which also included pricing for 2022. And we took the price of physicals per each member and applied that to our anticipated membership roster for 2022. In the supply category, um, can we, sorry. Can we do this? Can we see that? Supplies. Supplies, please. Okay. Okay, so in the supplies category. Um, I think, there we go. The operating supply line, you know, that's based on consumption of the operating supplies that have been used through uh, June of this year when we compiled the, the initial draft of this <laughs> budget. And it also includes the anticipated needs for Benton and Washington Township uh, based on the equipment in those stations in the call volumes and call types. Um, the vehicle maintenance supplies, there's actually a 17% reduction um, with additional apparatus coming in in January. And the main reason for this is some cost savings that we've experienced based on having a mechanic on staff to take care of oil changes. And we're just buying parts now and paying a lot less labor out to um, you know, subcontractors. So we've seen savings there and we're also we have someone who is experienced enough to maintain contact with some of these parts distributors so that we're buying parts directly and saving um, a lot of additional markup. Um, EMS supplies is based on the consumption of our current six stations and our call volume, and then applied to the eight stations and the total call volume. Uh, IVFA dues, that's the Indiana Volunteer Firefighters Association. Uh, that's based on $20 per year and we budgeted for 170 members annually. Uh, we do expect to have a recruiting uh, drive in 2022 to get our volunteer numbers um, ramped up. Uh, payroll supplies, this line is gonna be zeroed out and, and removed from budgets going forward. Uh, any future expenses will be paid for out of our office supplies or accounting services line. Um, and in the office supplies, we did actually um, maintain that budget as it was, even with the expansion uh, based off the cost that we've seen this year. Um, our fuel, this is a challenging one. And Lori and I had lots of discussions um, with, with Ed Brown, our fiscal officer, um, different members of the board. Um, this is hard to pinpoint. Um, I mean, between spring of this year and summer of this year, we saw an increase in fuel costs of about 25%. So we've went to kind of one of our average months, looked at what the costs were and applied that by what we have here now and what we believe we will have with our additional fuel costs from Benton and Washington. We moved two other lines into this category from the services and charges category. Uh, that was inspection and investigation supplies. 
um, we reduced that line $2,500 and then moved it into supplies because it was kind of inappropriately in the services category when it was being used for supplies all along. And then the hazardous materials mitigation supplies. Previously, that was in the service category because we actually paid $2,500 a year to Northern Monroe Fire Territory for fire or hazardous materials protection. Uh, but since we're the ones doing that now, uh, we've converted that and taken the money that would have been applied to that by the other departments and we're buying our supplies with those funds for hazardous materials incidents. In the services category, um, looking at legal counsel, we've based this budget um, on the actual cost for 2021, and as well as the anticipation of an association of Indiana fire protection districts, which will have a, a slight up, upfront cost um, to get it going. Uh, computer technical support, we moved FirstNet, which is the data for the mobile data terminals, all of the computers that are in the apparatus. Uh, we moved that to the telephone data service line because it's bundled with some of our other uh, bills and it was just easier to have that out of computer support and into our telephone data line, um, which shows a reduction of $10,000 in the computer technical support line, but it's not necessarily an overall budget deduction of 10,000, we just moved that. In accounting services, we increased $5,000 there, uh, just in anticipation of the increased payroll and the additional uh, receipts that'll be coming in um, for expenses related to Benton and Washington Township. In the telephone and data service line, there's an increase for those additional uh, mobile data terminal terminals located at Benton Township. Uh, and we also increased the phone and internet for the two additional fire stations, as well as the move from FirstNet, which I mentioned a minute ago. Uh, and contractual services, the line was formerly called paging system, but we've changed that to contractual services. And that line includes our service agreements with, with emergency reporting, which is our federally mandated fire incident reporting, our Gmail suite, the email accounts, a lab tech, which is a lot of our record management um, software, and then I am responding a fire response program. In postage, mail, supplies, and fees, uh, there's an increase based on plans that we have to send out some form of mailer, whether it be a postcard or a flyer. Um, you know, over the last several months, we've realized that there is definitely a need for us to send more information uh, to the homes of residents within the district. So we plan on getting together some form of news or information pamphlet and getting that information out. Um, and then again, in some of these other categories, there's just increases from moving from seven buildings to nine. Uh, those increases are in general liability insurance, uh, workers' compensation insurance, and utilities. As far as building repairs, we're separating out the expenses for building expense or repair uh, expenses and the equipment and vehicles. All of that's been in one line. All we're doing is separating that out. So we have a building repairs line that'll be $50,000 and an equipment and vehicle repairs line that'll be $100,000. Previously, those two were combined together. We're simply separating them out and putting numbers in those line items that reflect what we see in our expenses. That's really all I have walking through the general fund. Great. Thank you, Chief Dillard. And uh, my apologies to Lori Robinson. I didn't see you in the uh, in my grid there earlier, but uh, yeah. Ms. Robinson is uh, joining as a representative from the uh, fire protection district as well, too. Um, OK, so we'll see if there's any questions or uh, comments from council. Yes, Mr. McKim. Yes. Um, so obviously, the uh, one, one of the biggest uh, challenges that we had uh, last year was simply the increase in, in the property taxes that came from the large expansion of the of the district. And I'm, I wonder if either you, Chief Dillard or Ms. Robinson may want to uh, address the we, we've seen your draft uh, 4B, but you may want to address address the uh, property tax impacts uh, this year, because I think it's probably going to be good news to most of the taxpayers. So I think Lori will probably speak on that, but if I have the ability to share my screen, I can also show you some impacts that we've generated. 
if you yeah if, if you have that ability feel free okay. and we can get you that if not Lori, go yeah ahead. go ahead Lori, do you want to talk about the four b sure um as you can see i don't know if you can um pull up one of the four b's or not but we've uh, incorporated incorporating our new budget with our uh, anticipated revenues for next year. Um, we did get a new levy from the state, um, substantially higher than what we need this year. So um, in calculating our rate, we wanted to lock in the levy. We didn't want the certified net AV to fluctuate after we had already presented everything to the taxpayers. So instead of locking in our rate, we've locked in our levy so that if anything, um, if the NAV should go up, then the rate will even go down more than what we're going to advertise. So I think that's good news for everyone. Um, so as you can see on the 4B, the tax rate that we have budgeted is 2 point, or 0.2838. However, if the certified net AV goes up as we expect it to, our tax rate for the general fund will be 0.2669. So good news all around on that. Um, and like Chief said earlier, this does include the anticipated revenues that we'll get from the grant we got for the 14 new firefighters for this year. And, and just to follow up that, uh, that tax rate <clears throat> represents, I don't know, in, in the math, the back of the napkin math, I did about 21% decrease in the, uh, in the tax rates from 2021. So- In, in, uh, the, fire, in the fire tax rate. Correct. Well, no, actually that's overall, that's, that's fire plus CUME. Uh, yeah. yeah, correct, but not their overall tax rate. Right, right, correct. Just the, the, the district's com uh, component of the tax rate. So here's some information we put together earlier. It's something that uh, Councillor Hawk had requested last year at the budget sessions. Uh, and this, this slide, or this page, specifically looks at um, homes with standard and supplemental homestead credit deductions. Uh, this packet is hot off the press. It'll be on the website tomorrow. Uh, but you can see some estimates here for 100, dollars and $500,000 homes that have the standard and supplemental um, homestead credit. Again, the, the percent changes are practically the same across the board because all we can do is look at current um, um, township rates and then reduce it what we believe the fire rate is going to go down. And, you know, Lori mentioned the 0.2669. Um, I, I still think it's probably going to be slightly slower than that from our end. I feel like that's a conservative number um, and that's what these reflect here. So, Overall tax bills is what this information shows. And if the other rates remain the same and fire drops will be expected to, uh, these are those changes. And I guess the, just the one other comment I, I, I would make on that is the one reason why you're able to reduce the property tax rate though, of course, is because of the greatly increased lit that the district has been eligible for based on the increased property uh, tax levy last year. So. You know, I'm showing that you have about a 211% increase in lit uh, in 2022 over 2021. So that that's just the way that that the the property tax system works and the lit system works is that you know you get that echo. You know, you raise your property taxes, but then the next year it, it's kind of echoed in an increased share of the lit, uh, which helps you then reduce your property tax that uh, the subsequent year. And and just to build off of that. Um, it's not like all of those lit dollars are just new and coming out of nowhere. Um, some of those dollars are currently in the Van Buren uh, Township and Bloomington Township uh, revenue streams. Um, all of those entities, and I know you've talked about this in previous meetings, Jeff, um, you know, the, the slice of pie for the fire district is now different. Um, it'll back out a lot from Van Buren and Bloomington Townships but all of the entities in Monroe County will see some changes in theirs as a result of that increase. Right, just about everybody saw a loss uh, in lit with the exception of Washington Township because of the quirk and the way that the dissolution of fire territories work. But uh, 
Uh, yeah, definitely Bloomington Township and Van Buren Township for the reasons that you just said, uh, probably saw the biggest loss. And, and this page simply shows the same information, but for residential properties that don't have a homestead credit deduction. So again, this information, this packet will be on the district's website tomorrow. And uh, everyone should feel free to go there and grab a copy of the PDF. If you have any questions about this information, you're always more than welcome to call Lori or I uh, here at the district office as well. Or just email it to us. Yep, I sent it uh, just before the meeting. Um, you should be getting a copy soon. Great. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? Um, yes, Councillor Hawk. Uh, if you could just go through the difference between what the uh, your income tax was for 2021, what you projected to be for 2022, and then really expect it to be more for 2023. Is that correct? Because yeah. the levy. It's always like working a year late. So do you have those numbers Ju just for the public to see? Uh, uh, Marty, are you asking about the levy, uh, what we've done with the levy? Well, I was actually talking about the income tax revenue. Okay, I'm seeing it now. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the, the increase in the district's levy to add Bentman Washington Township will slightly increase the lit, but we'll also lose a little bit of lit because the actual levy amount is lowered by almost uh, $2 million um, by the lit revenue coming in in 2022. And, and, and Jeff is probably much better off to explain that than I am, but there's a little bit of an offset going in from 2022 to 2023. Yeah, no, this is good. Any other questions or comments? All right, well, um, what, do any of our other representatives from the Fire Protection District have additional information they'd like to present to council this evening? Um, I just wanted to add one more thing about the levy. Um, and you'll see that when we advertise um, with our budget form for the levy that we're asking for for this year versus last year is actually seeing a reduction of about 6%. And that, that also is reflective of all the hard work that we've done keeping our budget down this year and going into next year, I think. That's good. Very good. Okay. Well, if there are no other uh, questions or uh, any comments from council members? Uh, we'll take a roll call vote now to accept the Monroe Fire Protection District. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Hawk. Uh, yes, uh, many of us on the council uh, received emails during the year having to do with your budgets and uh, many of uh, the folks said that they were going to follow along with your budgets as it moved along. Uh, do you believe that you have answered all their questions if they've asked them? And uh, we know before, years ago, when it was not the Monroe Fire District, it was the very clear. We had one gentleman who was always there to question. And so uh, we just want to make sure that, that people understand uh, and have you've taken time to explain to them as best you can the changes in budgets. And do you believe that they have, that you've been able to answer the questions? You know, I, I believe that we've been able to answer their questions. I believe that we've been able to explain why these changes have taken place and uh, you know the time and effort that's gone into these. Um, I think a lot of people, once they understood what was going on, it made more sense to them. It was really confusing um, all around. Um, the bills that people received because a lot of people in Van Buren and Bloomington Township, they saw astronomical percent changes in the special district. And a lot of them did not understand that that 1700% was mostly offset by the lowering of the township. But if you looked at just the percent changes, 
it was really confusing because it would show like a 1700% increase in the special district and, you know, a 30% decrease or whatnot in the um, township. So once we were kind of able to look at numbers, I think we were able to answer a lot of questions. I know Lori and I have fielded a lot of phone calls about property tax bills, um, had a lot of pleasant conversations. You know, there are still some people that, that are still upset. There are people that, you know, still think that we went too much too quickly. Um, you know, and I understand those concerns. Um, but I really believe that we've done this in a diligent, sincere manner and that we've done everything that we can to, to get this information out there. And, you know, it's like I mentioned the, the flyers earlier, the, the mailing, you know, short of going door to door, I think we've done a lot to explain and, and present this information. But if we can send some mailers out going forward, you know, every quarter or twice a year and keep people up to date with what we're doing and what's going on, we will be able to go door to door in that manner. So. No, I think we've had a lot of good conversations. Um, there are still people that are disappointed, and I and I understand that. Um, but I also think that they understand um, where we've come from and where we're going with this budget. And uh, I think that they support us. It's just, uh, you know, there were some people, if you look at those numbers that we looked at a little bit ago, um, there are some people definitely impacted uh, by the cost of this change. Uh, but I think what we're getting out of it uh, in comparison to that cost, it is really, uh, you know, a good bang for the buck, if you will. Uh, but that doesn't lessen the load that, that some people bear this year. So I, th I think we've done okay, Lori. Well, and I think it's taken some time for people to accept the fact that once Bloomington, once the fire uh, territory came in to place, then they had much higher salaries. And so in order to even it out, the, the folks that were going to be in the fire district, that, that caused a great change in salaries. And that I think was a big one that people were looking at, uh, didn't always uh, appreciate, but you can't have one group of people making a whole lot more than somebody else right next to them doing the same work. So we have that sort of discussion here at the county level. Yeah, so thank and, you. And, and we had that discussion with some folks that called because they wanted to know why we had this jump. And I explained to them the research that we had done. And, and really overall, the, the pay increases that we had, um, it was short of 3% of the entire budget uh, for this year in that leap. So yeah, dollar wise, it looked like a large amount if you looked at how much things increased from one to the other. But in the big picture of this budget, um, that accounted for less than 3% of the change. It really was. I mean, the, the big change from 2020 to 2021 is, is just straightforward boots on the ground. And, and I think that we were able to present that to people. Um, we have a visual, and I don't have it pulled up right now to show you, but we do have a visual of what staffing looked like with fire helmets before and what staffing looked like with fire helmets um, now. And I'll present that uh, the next time we get together. I just don't have it readily available. I just wanted to acknowledge what some of their concerns with it. And I appreciate you discussing it. And I, I'd also like to acknowledge I, the, um, the manner in which the district um, handled all of that. And I thought it was uh, very admirable. I know that there were uh, probably a lot more questions than we ever thought would come up. I mean, we've, we've provided a lot of opportunities. And I think that was a, a big goal of everyone going into that last year was the, the number of meetings that uh, were had. And, and we wanted to provide lots of opportunities for the public to engage. And, um, you know, sometimes that can be a challenge, especially in a, a pandemic year. Uh, people have their minds on other things. And it may have caught them a little off guard, uh, despite our best efforts. And, um, you know, so, so that was uh, kind of a learning opportunity, I think, for everybody. But I thought the district did a, just a fantastic job of handling all of that. Um, so, so thanks for the professionalism uh, and getting people the information uh, that they needed. Mr. McKim? Um, yeah, just, and just to follow up on the public uh, issue, can, can you quickly 
outline the additional opportunities for the public to uh, provide input on uh, on the district's budget and tax rates and levies. I'm sorry, Jeff, what, what exactly do you mean? You, there are still opportunities for a public hearing on the on the budget and there are yes, yeah, so there are still opportunities for the public to to make comment. And maybe maybe Michelle would have those dates or or Ms. Robinson. Uh, the dates for the public to comment is October the fourth, October nineteenth, or October eighteenth and October nineteenth. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Robinson? Yes, I just wanted to um, let the public know a couple other things with um, the hard work that our district has put in this year on trying to um, apply for a new ISO rating. We, I know that the chief could explain that a little bit better than I could, but anything that we can do to increase our ISO rating for fire protection throughout the district is gonna help people on the back end with their homeowner's insurance. Um, we're hoping to see um, residents be able to apply for new policies that give them a lower homeowner's insurance rate as well. And I just want to, I don't want to leave out our board of trustees. Our board of trustees have been very supportive throughout this whole year and very involved in helping us talk to people in the public and uh, field some of the comments that we got during tax time and help explain to people what that increase was for this year and that it is headed down. Very good. All right, any, any further questions or comments before we vote to accept the Fire Protection District Special Fire Budget? Okay, seeing none, we'll have a roll call vote. Mayor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Spoonmore? Yes. Councillor Munson? You're muted. Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Wiltz? Yes. Councillor Deckard is not present still, and Councillor Hawk? Uh, yes. Motion passed unanimously six to zero. Mr. President? Yes. Uh, to be clear, what we did just then was we accepted the presentation. That did not mean that we were voting in favor or against. We've accepted what they presented to us. And now we will listen to the public uh, when those times are correct or they can contact us if they have additional concerns. Thank you. I, I, we can't reiterate it enough. I hope I clarified that in my initial comments earlier on a couple different occasions and we've uh, we've heard it again now and uh, we may need to reiterate that again throughout the meeting. Yes. So we'll, we'll move on to the next uh, budget here. Council, I move to open for discussion and review Fund 8691 Monroe Fire Protection Special Cumulative Fire. Personnel zero, supplies zero, services zero, Capital nine hundred thirteen thousand seven hundred fifty eight dollars for a total of nine hundred thirteen thousand seven hundred fifty eight dollars. Second. All right. Feel free to uh, provide any information on this budget for us, Chief Dillard or uh, Ms. Robinson. <laughs> Sorry. So our cumulative fund is pretty straightforward. Um, we, we utilize most of our cumulative fund to, to pay what some folks might use a debt service fund for. So there are lots of payments for capital expenditures in our um, cumulative fund. And then we also purchase a lot of capital items out of there. So just running through the lines, um, the small vehicles, that's the replacement of vehicles such as squads, brush trucks, uh, support vehicles, utilities, and command vehicles. Um, with the fleet that we have now, uh, we hope to replace two to three small vehicles a year. If it's a command vehicle, we can do three. If it's a brush type vehicle, we can do two. Uh, but we've got a, a plan in place to, to utilize the funds 
uh, to do that in the small vehicle line. Uh, miscellaneous equipment, capital outlays, just used for things like fire hose, emergency lights, uh, the sirens that are on trucks, hand tools, um, you know, and other types of uh, firefighting or um, capital EMS expenses. Um, personal protective equipment, uh, you know, this budget contains funds to replace an entire uh, 25 cents. Uh, the reason that this is important is uh, in FPA standards state the maximum life of turnout gear is 10 years. So if we can replace 10% of our um, uh, PPE uh, each year, uh, we stay on track with not having a large year in which we have a huge expenditure. Uh, Station 21, uh, that's the actual uh, payment for 2022. That's what's budgeted. Uh, there are models. Uh, this includes estimated costs for repairs and upgrades to some of our existing fire stations. Um, this line does still include some previously awarded PS lit funds for the upgrades to Station 23 down in Indian Creek Township. Uh, that project is long overdue. We were hoping to get some additional funds last year. Uh, we weren't able to do so, uh, but we are committing the funds this year to, to revamp and remodel that station, which it, it desperately needs it uh, due to the fact it wasn't originally designed to house firefighters and we've had them in there for a couple of years now. So uh, those changes are coming. Uh, Rescue 22 is the actual cost of the payment for 2022. Same thing with engine 22. Uh, Quit 59 is a good one. It's the budget is for the actual payment for 2022. However, uh, if it's financially feasible and things at this moment look good, don't want to jinx this, uh, don't need any emergency breakdowns or repairs, but uh, we would like to just go ahead and pay that off at the end of 2021 if funds are available at the end of December. So that is something that, that may uh, be unnecessary next year, uh, but we're budgeting for it, uh, worst case scenario. That is pretty much the key of the fund. All right, very good. Let's see if we have any questions or comments on the special cumulative fire budget. Mr. Iverson. Uh, uh, Chief Dillard, as uh, you noted earlier in your presentation, something like 70% of the county is under your purview. Uh, do you find that your vehicles uh, are, are, are appropriately uh, equipped and, and you're up to the task of, of meeting that demand? Oh, I think so. Um, you know, I think in, in the fire service, every day it changes. Every day we find out there's a piece of equipment that's out there that, that we need. And I think that we have the funds and the budgets to buy those things as we need them. Uh, needs, not necessarily wants. Um, but, you know, the first part of this year was different because we had that cash flow issue. Uh, so there are a lot of things that we've held on this year. Um, and in the second half of the year, we've been able to make some purchases. But for the most part, no, I really feel like we're putting ample equipment and buying equipment that we need as we see it um, as a necessity. Um, Vehicle-wise, I'll I, I be honest with you, some of the command vehicles, um, we are seeing an uptick in the cost of repairs. Um, and I think it's just simply because we're covering so much more road mileage than we were previously. Uh, some of these vehicles are traveling clear across the county for some types of calls. And that's, that's part of it. And it's something that uh, we're getting used to. Very good. Uh, Councilor Wiltz. Thank you, uh, Chief Dillard. I, I just, I don't have a question so much as I just wanted to thank you for, um, you're such an organized presenter. And I just, I appreciate being um, handheld as it might appear, um, but it's just a very thorough presentation. And um, I just wanted to thank you for that. And um, cause I know it's, you make it look very easy to pull all these numbers together. And I know it's, it's a lot. Um, the other thing is I also appreciate the, um, in this particular budget, the asset management approach that you're taking with um, replacement of uh, capital that's spread out over time because that's critical to being able to anticipate, you know, costs um, in the long run and really kind of maintain a, 
a stable uh, budget because there are so many other things we can't budget for um, in that way. So I appreciate that. And uh, thanks so much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wiltz. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Ms. Hawk. Uh, Do uh, Chief Dillard, I just wondered if we have any start date for the uh, uh, renovation work there on that fire station that uh, really needs it for people to be able, your staff be able to stay there yeah. as needed. That, we'll do you plan this fall or, or wait till tomorrow or tomorrow next year? Yeah, no, I, I think it's definitely going to be next year. Um, we have command staff meetings every Thursday and I was asked about this last week and I said, look, we're budgeting for it. Let's get through the final adoptions and make sure the funds are there and then we will get things moving. But I think next spring, uh, the, the project that we need to do, is, it's fairly invasive for that structure, but overall it's not a major project as far as the big picture. Um, I think it's something that we'll have completed within uh, you know, a couple months. So I think next spring, um, if, if the funds are available and approved, um, next spring we'll have that completed. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Iverson, did you have another question? I did. Uh, Chief Dillard, um, I had a question about naloxone and uh, number one, it, do you have a, a, a study supply of, of that life-saving drug? And number two, have you found that your rates of use of, of that life-saving drug have gone up or down, or do you have any data on that? I don't have data um, readily available right now. I, I do, we do carry it. We do have a steady stock. Um, to be honest with you, I can tell you that quite frequently uh, we arrive on scene um, and there's a Monroe County Sheriff's deputy already on scene and sometimes has it administered uh, the drug prior to arrival. Um, but I can get that data and get it sent to you, but it is something that we carry. It's something our folks are mm-hmm. treating. And um, you know, I wouldn't say that I see have seen an uptick uh, in that statistic. Um, I will say that there are times, you know, um, you hear the firefighters talk about it, you know, something bad's come to the community. And there are times where there'll be a week or two where we have an increased call volume in that type. Um, but, you know, year for year, I, I don't know that data. I'll have to put it together and I can do that and get it sent to you. Uh, I appreciate that. And it's good to hear that uh, our sheriff's deputies are on the scene and taking action. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no problem. That's <laughs> something that our folks include in their narratives and, and we do see that. Very good. Uh, Councilor Munson. Yes, Chief Dillard, uh, in response to uh, Councilor Hawk's uh, question, um, I want you to affirm that for the public that there are people at the fire station 24-7. They are staying there uh, at Indian Creek. They are just not uh, staying there in the most uh, comfortable and best circumstances. Yeah, so let me elaborate on that real quick, and I'll be brief. Um, We made modifications to what was previously an office uh, to make fire code um, uh, bedroom facilities for uh, firefighters to stay. Um, Some of the problems that we encountered there is um, there's not an exhaust system for the uh, removal of carcinogens when the trucks are running. Uh, The kitchen is right off of the garage is not necessarily sealed up well uh, to keep those contaminants out of that area. Um, same thing with the day room. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great facility. It just wasn't designed to have folks stay there overnight. And we're going to put it some safety functions in and make accommodations so that, you know, they're not walking through the apparatus bays past their precision lace turn out here uh, to go to the restroom or to go to the kitchen. Um, and, you know, we've maxed it out. There's really room for two firefighters to stay there. So if we have a storm night, some volunteers want to come in. Currently, we don't have that room. Um, those are those are problems that we're going to solve with this renovation. But it is staff 24-7 right now. Uh, we just need to make it more, um, more I would really say safe uh, for our folks that are staying there in the long term. Thank you. Any anything further from council? All right.
right. If not, we will have a roll call vote to accept, not approve the Monroe Fire Protection District's special cumulative fire budget. Councillor Welts? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Spoonmore? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. And Councillor Deckard is still not present. Motion passed unanimously six to zero. Very good. That will conclude uh, our budgets for the Fire Protection District. Thank you all for joining us. And we'll now move on to the Solid Waste Management District. Council, I move to open for discussion and review Fund 8210 Solid Waste Management Special Operating. Personnel Category $1,390,885. Supplies, $166,350. Services, $1,238,125. Capital, $31,200. For a total budget of $2,826,560. Second. All right. And uh, welcome, Mr. McGlasson and Ms. Martin. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and then, uh, I, if I could, to start, um, for those who don't know, introduce uh, Ms. Kathy Martin, uh, who took over as our controller uh, at, at the end of April. And uh, so I get, be gentle, this is her first budget go around. So. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure that you will make her feel welcome. Um, and uh, but to, uh, to get into the budget, um, I just uh, start with the personnel expenses. Um, would note if, um, if you'll recall, over the past uh, a couple of years, um, our, our board uh, has, has made an effort to get our uh, minimum rate of pay up to $15 an hour um, to provide a living wage for our employees. Uh, and this, this budget does do that. Um, based on uh, <clears throat> the CPI index that we annually use to, uh, to determine um, wage increases. Uh, all employees uh, were provided with a $900 annual flat increase uh, to their pay, and, and then those employees that were still below the $15 an hour level uh, were just brought up to $15 an hour um, <clears throat> to, to accomplish that. So um which you know, and that resulted in a, you know uh, as you can see on there almost twenty-eight thousand dollar increase in, in our wages um but it's certainly something uh that we think is important for our employees and it's certainly uh, something that's manageable by the district um uh the, the other big personnel services uh change uh, is uh, uh annually an increase in health insurance premiums um uh we were able to uh uh, take a little bit, uh, make a little bit of a dent in that um, this year. Um, we did uh, uh, through some some attrition with employees. Uh, we did wind up at uh, our main South Walnut Recycling Center. Uh, we did some restructured, some restaffing uh, when some people left, and we're able to not fill a position. Uh, that position is still on the books, but is vacant. Uh, and at this time, uh, there is no foreseeable need and no intent to fill that position. Uh, so uh, eliminating that position from the insurance numbers uh, made that 13% that increase a little more palatable, about 25,000. So, um, and I did, do you wanna go section by section or do you want me to go through the whole thing and then do questions? Yeah, go, uh, go through the whole budget and then we can okay. do All questions. Right. Yeah. And then uh, as we move down into supplies and, and also you'll see um, <clears throat> when we do the, the services, um, for anybody that, that's not aware, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the district over the course of the summer has been working on uh, updating the solid waste management plan, uh, which is something that solid waste districts throughout the state are required to have. Um, and that's something that we've, we've been working on throughout the summer, um, actually have uh, what, we, what we hope is a final document prepared uh, for our, our board to vote on at their meeting tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so you'll see a number of, uh, in the comments section on the right, 
uh, a number of things that are just uh, identified as an anticipated need due to this, the updated solid waste management plan. Uh, we can certainly get into the details uh, as much as, as I can, um, if, if, if you wish, but uh, that's the explanation on a, on a handful of these uh, increases as we go through there. Um, we had uh, a $7,000 decrease in our health and safety line, uh, but that had to do this year, we had budgeted uh, the purchase of uh, AED devices for all of our recycling centers, uh, which is, is something we've been wanting to do uh, for some time. Um, and I will tell you that has actually not occurred yet. Um, uh, we were actually kind of waiting to get through this budget cycle because um, what we're now considering doing uh, is either leasing those devices or uh, entering into a, um, a lease with an option to buy. Um, you'll, you'll see later we have some money budgeted for those lease agreements, but uh, that lease agreement would allow us to get the devices in place and have a third party uh, take responsibility for maintaining and managing those devices uh, so that we're, we have assurances uh, that, you know, in the event that they're needed, they're going to work. Um, so that, that's what we're interested in, in pursuing at this time. Um, uh, big increase in general operating supplies and that $20,000, and that's, uh, that, that is specific to, to doing new signage uh, at all of our uh, locations. Um, I don't know uh, how, how many of you are, how frequently you're, you're at our facilities, but uh, our, our signage uh, is, is certainly uh, in need of some uh, upgrading uh, and improvements. Um, and, and along those lines, that also is uh, related to our solid waste management plan and the discussions of preparing that plan and making that update. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of interest raised in potentially uh, rebranding the district, which would potentially be a new logo, uh, which would automatically mean new signage. Uh, so, um, so there is... Uh, uh, that, that the rebranding is not to say that we're going to change the services or programs that we're offering to the community. Uh, just an interest in trying to make some changes uh, to maybe help uh, help us promote ourselves, get our message out there, and 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 try to to make some improvements and in, uh, increasing recycling, waste management in general, and reducing the waste going to final disposal. Uh, and then the, lastly, in supplies, you see it. Uh, $2,300 increase in the other supply line. Uh, and again, that's just an anticipated need um, for changes that'll take place uh, with the, with the uh, adoption of the updated solid waste management plan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, services and charges. <clears throat> um, it, it, it decrease in our legal line. I'm, uh, I don't recall if this was discussed last year. How many of you are aware we did uh, uh, we did last, last year switch from a private counsel to using the county attorney's office uh, as our legal representation, uh, which is a substantial savings for us. Um, but uh, for next year, we did want to have, leave some money in there uh, for, for an outside counsel, a private counsel that we had previously used. Um, if I, um, oh, I think that everybody is aware at this point, Rumpke has proposed uh, to... Pro to uh, um, permit, uh, construct and operate a, a new, a, a second transfer station in the county. Um, and uh, based on uh, our current agreement with uh, Republic Services that owns Hoosier Disposal, uh, that's gonna require us uh, to negotiate with Rumpke to enter into a similar host fee agreement to what's in place with Republic Services. Uh, and it was staff's and the board's uh, desire um, to retain the previous council that uh, is more familiar with the existing agreement to help us uh, move forward and negotiate that host fee agreement uh, with the wrong key. So, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the engineering line, um, it's, it's down 3,000. Uh, that, that goes up and down on an annual basis. Uh, this year, um, we had every, th every three years, we, we do some serving on the groundwater wells at the landfill that was due this year. Uh, so that's not gonna happen next year. And that's the reduction that you see there. Um, a $4,000 increase for consultants. Uh, again, just kind of anticipating uh, with the plan update and if we're gonna to, to change the way that we promote ourselves, the way that we brand ourselves, uh, thoughts of uh, having a consultant come in to help and assist with 
whether that be developing a new logo, developing a new ad campaign, uh, whatever, we just felt that some outside consultation might be beneficial to move forward with those things. Um, Twenty thousand dollar increase for other professional services uh, that is specific to demolish. Um, uh, what what is the last remaining structure of the old landfill? Out <laughs> of the landfill, um, but uh, it's it's a it's a building um, that that has that has served this purpose. It's not currently serving us a purpose. Um, and um, last uh, last fall, we're doing some repair work. Um, on that building um, and it's it's a building that was added on to an existing building and it has one wall of it in essence is a hollow wall and uh, has, has some welding um, sparks fall down in there and had some bird nests in there that caught on fire and uh, <clears throat> not, a, not a major deal but we did have a small fire out there uh, the damage the building to the point that uh, uh, repairs and demolition were about equal in cost uh, and uh, we, we decided that uh, you know, based on uh, how little the building is used uh, by us um, and uh, the potential hazards, to, uh, unfortunately, we do have, uh, you know, some um, uh, history of, of trespassing, um, you know, people, it's, it's hard to keep people out of that site. Uh, and we didn't want somebody to be out there uh, trespassing. Um, and God forbid, you know, something happened with that building and a wall fall on them or something. Uh, so it either needs to be repaired or be taken down. Um, and our thought was that uh, dem demolishing it was probably best. We don't have an identified use for it. <clears throat> on the next line of medical services, uh, there's a substantial increase. Uh, again, that's um, the majority of that is based on the lease agreement for the AED devices uh, at seven locations the five recycling centers, the administration building and the, at the landfill um, where we do have, I do have one building left out there, but it's uh, from the old recycling center where we do our leachate treatment uh, plant and do still have staff out there on a regular basis as well as contractors. Um, a professional and social media, a $5,000 increase. Uh, again, that uh, back to the, the solid waste management plan and uh, big push uh, you know, anticipate doing a big, big push for uh, advertising and promoting um, you know, the, the new branding of the district, and we'll be ready to move forward with that. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then uh, on the next page, um, the line uh, printing, um, 7750 increase there. Um, that is uh, to print the new service guides. We have a, a small booklet that we have available um, uh, that we distribute at our facilities uh, to area 10, um, uh, looking at working with the realtors for new home buyers, but uh, just a service guide to provide to residents uh, to uh, tell them about the district, what we offer, what we can do uh, and, and encourage them to, uh, whether through us or through somebody else, um, re recycle, reduce waste and, uh, reduce what's going to final disposal. Uh, $8,000 increase in uh, media advertising. Uh, again, push related to the plan update, um, additional promotion. Um, the, the media advertising, we, we advertise uh, uh, on, uh, I guess we have a contract with Comcast, uh, which uh, for television advertising, as well as uh, a digital advertising uh, through internet streaming services that Comcast has some control over. We also do some radio advertising. Um, I think our utilities came down um, a pretty decent amount, except for water. Uh, that's just based on uh, what rates and our, our current usage uh, has been over the past uh, few years. Um, Senior and equipment repair and maintenance is coming down based on previous experience. Um, uh, $20,000 decrease in our leachate disposal line. Um, and, uh, and that's just, we had, we had a bad year and uh, budgeted based on that a few years ago and uh, uh, have not had to haul that much since. Um, and that was kind of at this point thinking that was kind of a, an outlier year and uh, that budget uh, is higher than is necessary. Um, our electronics disposal uh, is coming down. That's you know strictly based on 
the volume that we receive and uh, what it costs us uh, with our vendor to get those recycled. Um, collection disposal contracts uh, is going up a little bit. Um, you may recall, it was discussed at last year's budget hearing that uh, we did uh, uh, a couple of years ago, increase the price of our orange bags. Um, so that's, uh, that additional revenue is help offsetting the increases uh, for those disposal contracts. Um, our hauling contract has an $1,800 increase, not significant, just point out that is a contractual increase. Uh, the contract uh, with uh, River Public Services calls for 1% increase per year um, on the hauling rates. Um, and then um, on the tire recycling, do you want to point out we have a uh, $5,000 increase uh, in that. And that's uh, based on there's, there's an offsetting revenue line item for that as well. Um, we're, we're interested in pursuing um, a waste tire program where we would provide a service to residents uh, to, to try and get waste tires recycled uh, or properly disposed of. Um, that, uh, that, that comes from the number of illegal dumping complaints we get that involve tires, the number of calls we get from residents asking what they can do with old tires, how do they get rid of them. Uh, there, there are a couple uh, of shops in town um, that I believe that will do it, um, but uh, it's something that we're interested in investigating. Uh, there is just for councils Council's uh, information as well as the public. There, there's a statutory process uh, that we have to go to go through um, <clears throat> in order to to provide waste management services uh, that just uh, basically um, make sure that uh, that we're providing a service that that is not currently provided or or that we're not uh, going using tax dollars to create an unfair competition advantage with an existing provider. Uh, so, you know, no guarantees that that program will happen, but uh, we do, uh, based on our, uh, you know, illegal dumping um, complaints and the calls that we receive, there does appear to be a need uh, for something like that. So we want to investigate that. Um, uh, and we have um, on the capital, um, twenty thousand dollar increase for vehicle purchases. Uh, that's to get a new uh, education or outreach vehicle. Uh, the current vehicle is a, is a two thousand and four model. Uh, that, although for being that old, um, doesn't have a great deal of mileage on it. But over the past two or three years, we've been putting more into repairs on that vehicle than the book value of it. Uh, so it does appear uh, that's it's time to move on from that vehicle and 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 get something uh, newer. And then, um, then we have a twelve hundred dollar, um, as I'm sure that we've all learned from the past year and a half. Uh, having the ability to work remotely and mobily uh, is important, and so we wanted to get a laptop uh, from Ms. Martin uh, to ensure that uh, for situations like this, she can become available when we need her. That kind of hits the highlights of uh, of our operating budget. Happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much. Let's see if we have any questions for you. Uh, are there any uh, any questions or comments from council? Mr. Iverson. Uh, first of all, I want to commend you on the uh, $15 an hour minimum wage. I think that's fantastic. I think that's the way, you know, the, things are moving. So uh, really want to commend you on that. Uh, secondly, um, I, you're Thank you for uh, your Twitter uh, account. Uh, that's uh, really great. And for those of you who don't follow uh, the Solid Waste District on Twitter, you should. It's good. Uh, and, and my last question is about your green business network. And I was wondering if there are fees charged that you collect for that business network and, and how that necessarily works. Uh, yeah, uh, and I just I just start say that uh, the, the Twitter handle is at Go Green District. Uh, for, the, for those that are interested in uh, taking you up on your uh, recommendation. And, uh, but yeah, for the Green Business Network, it is a fee-based service. Um, and I apologize, I don't have details in front of me there, but there, there's a free fee structure. It's based on how frequently um, the customer wants us to collect materials from them. And, um, and I'm, that's, uh, uh, um, Sorry, I'm trying to look and see what um, 
we have uh, about uh, for 2022, uh, we've estimated proposed $20,000 in revenue from the fees collected um, for the subscribers to that service. That's wonderful. That's a, that's a great program and it's definitely needed. So thank you. Great, uh, Councilor Wilkes. Uh, thanks. Um, I liked the, uh, the tire recycling uh, program sounds promising because um, I know that can be a very large source of bulky, awful waste. So hopefully that works out. Um, I was wondering though, I might you might have said this um, and I, I might have missed it, the hazardous household waste disposal program, that was down for a big chunk of at least um, 2020, if I recall. We couldn't bring certain things like paint, that kind of stuff in. Um, is it up running? Uh, it, it is. Uh, it, it was It was actually only fully shut down for two or three weeks. Uh, oh, okay. But then, but then it opened limited. Uh, we were just open, I think, two days a week, and then we went to three, and, and as, as things settled down you know we we gradually increased that but that it's it's a it's a part of located at our south walnut recycling center and that facility is back uh five days uh, a week um 7 30 to 5 30 tuesday through saturday so. so i can bring all my paint in huh you can <laughs> all right um the the electronics disposal you said um is going based on experience or past year's experience, you're budgeting less for that. Is that taking into consideration though that a lot of folks maybe stayed home and didn't bring things in for the past year or so? Um, you know, it's actually, no, it, it's, it's not. Um, and part of that uh, has to do with that we're, you know, we've been back open for a few months now at five days a week. Um, and uh, we did see an, uh, an initial push surge uh, as things started to open back up. Yeah, people were holding on to things. And, and um, you know, we would certainly appreciate that they did that rather than pitch it in the trash and, and wait to get it taken care of properly. Um, and we're happy to manage that stuff for them. But I, you know, our, um, thing, I, things have settled down. And as far as the flow of customers, the volume of materials that we're getting, you know, right now through those facilities are back in line with where we were uh, pre-pandemic. Okay, okay, great. I have a couple more questions. Um, Go ahead. Is that, okay. Um, I wanted just to ask and about the, um, the plan that you had, had mentioned and the fact that one is required. And I think that it would be beneficial if you could just talk a little bit about um, the benefits <laughs> that, and, and of the plan once it's in place, what, what it actually means for the district to have a good plan? Well, I, I mean, it, it, it in essence, um, I, guess I used this term with Miss Munson the other day when we were talking. It gives the district a playbook to, to work from. Uh, you, know, it, it, you know, a big chunk of the plan is, is demographic information, inventorying facilities and services, and activities that are going on right now. Uh, but but then, you know, it also does list out a variety of goals and objectives uh, in a number of different categories. Uh, you know, the, the, the district is, is looking to pursue over the next five years that the plan covers. So, so it gives us, a, a, you know, a playbook, a course of action uh, to follow moving forward. Does it make you eligible for um, grants or programs or anything like that to have the plan or maybe not eligible, but more competitive? Um, potentially. Um, I'm, you know, I've, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of, of any... Um, you know, of the, the state grants, item grants that, uh, you know, specifically state, you get bonus points for having the plan, but, but obviously having that in place and depending on what you're pursuing a grant for, it may help you uh, with, the, you know, supporting documentation to justify your request uh, and win the grant. Are you putting anything in place to kind of look at the goals and uh, maybe measure um, achievement of those goals over the five years? Uh, yeah, um, there is, um, the plan has an appendix um, that spells out the, uh, 
or I guess it lists out all the goals and objectives uh, and, um, you know, provides some, some options, some recommendations, uh, courses of action to take to move forward toward pursuing them, uh, as well as metrics that can be used uh, to measure uh, the progress and success uh, of moving toward those goals and objectives. That's great. Great. Thank you. Hey, any further questions or discussion? Yes, Ms. Hawk. Uh, yes, I don't have the documents in front of me now, uh, but on one portion it was showing that you did not have enough revenue to cover your proposed budget. It wasn't by a whole lot, but that had been on your... Uh, is that, are you, is, is that, did you get that from the full, Form 4B? That, that might have been... I, I'm sorry, I just I, don't have it in front of I, me. I, yeah, I pulled that up today, um, and for, for some reason, the property tax levy and the property tax cap impact lines on the adopted amount uh, are blank. So it's have not been put into the Form 4B that I was able to pull off today, uh, which would be, I think, why that you're, you're seeing that deficit. Um, you know, based on, based on our uh, review with DLGF and the property tax uh, numbers, um, property and the excise tax numbers that we were given, along with our, you know, our additional sources of revenue, uh, we actually project uh, this budget to have a $1,550 surplus. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't mean to question it. It's just that I thought, well, what are they doing if, you know, you don't pass a budget if you can't save the chat the money to cover it. And then uh, real quick, I hope that you will when, when you're working with your advertising or whatever, you, you uh, consider that adopt a road program that had been happening. I don't notice that it's been happening lately. Uh, but even if you took pictures of maybe shaming everybody who dumps all their trash along the roadways, uh, we're hearing complaints of that every year that our beautiful county is being uh, destroyed by careless, uncaring people by just throwing all their uh, whatever's left from the restaurants or whatever drive through. And if you live close to a drive through, you've got trash pickup every day. So that I would like to see that included somehow uh, in reaching the public. Certainly, and that is a, it's a program that we are you know proud of and and and. Uh, I'm pleased with the participation that we get. Obviously, you can always get more. Um, I, we, we do currently have um, two television commercials and two radio spots specific to the Adopt a Road program. Uh, okay. they're, they're not constantly running. We have, um, we have a number of uh, advertising um, commercial spots available, and we kind of rotate through those. But uh, yeah, the Adopt a Road ones are in there in that rotation. and. Uh, and do get out there, and that is certainly something uh, as we get into next year with the, the, the plan update and, and additional monies for uh, advertising and promotion, we could look at uh, doing more for the Adoptero program. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilor Monson. First, I want to thank uh, Mr. McGlasson for such an excellent presentation, and also Ms. Martin, who's worked very hard on this uh, budget work. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know what happened with the Form 4B, but we have had some confusion with with DLGF. And uh, when Mr. McGlasson checked checked in with DLGF, everything was was on course and fine. So um, I imagine it's just a matter of getting things updated. We're very excited about uh, the new five-year management plan, and we will be sharing it on the, <clears throat> on the district's website as soon as it's adopted, which I hope will be tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we've had great involvement by the staff, and also our Citizens Advisory Committee has worked very hard on this, and uh, kudos to them uh, for their excellent work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McKim. Yes, uh, thanks. I, I know we need to move on, but I guess I needed to follow up on the 4B uh, topic. 
Uh, I, the, the issue that Councillor Hawk was referring to is not the that the adopted amount doesn't show the column doesn't show that property tax levy. I, I get that. The advertised amount is the column that, that we look at. And indeed, that one that if you use all those numbers, you do get a very small deficit uh, for the year of twenty nine thousand two hundred fifty four dollars. But you know, on the other hand, that still leaves you with an operating balance of fifty eight percent, which is well over the what what mm -hmm. most units would consider a target. So I think that's you know it's certainly a, a properly funded budget. But but technically, Councilor Hawk was right that that current year projected expenditures are just slightly over current year projected uh, deficits but yeah you've got a substantial cash balance to be able to fund the budget what? i miss i miss was she referring miss hawk were you referring to the current budget or the proposed budget i maybe i misunderstood the 4b if you look at the 4b right. the i'm i'm sorry i reviewed it very quickly and i just thought oh this there's something amiss here and I didn't study it uh, thoroughly because I was waiting for your presentation. So uh, it seems you're on top of it. So. And I, and I do recall um, in, in, along these same lines, last year we had some discrepancies uh, based on uh, either factoring in or not factoring in the tax cap impact. Right. And then that may be what's happened again here. Right, you have to do that. And the tax cap impact is properly factored in, factored in in your 4B. Correct. Your 4B looks good. It just shows a slight deficit budget. That's that, that's all, but it's fine. It's it's perfectly well done and you have a like a like we said a greater than uh, recommended operating balance. You've got plenty of money to fund the yeah. budget. Okay. Okay, and I just I just had a quick question about the uh, the pay increases. Huh? That was uh, you, you'd mentioned that was a nine hundred dollar flat increase for all employees, and then anyone that was left under fifteen dollars an hour was bumped up to fifteen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, Did, correct. What, what was the average? What does that amount to in terms of an average uh, percent raise per employee? Mm. Oh. Yeah, see, now you throw okay. curveballs. Um, <laughs> it's something like three, three and a half percent. Yeah, it was, it, yeah, it was, uh, I think, I think what I calculated came in at 2.9. And so we just, and so I, that 300 was based on 3%. Or the okay, 900, sure. the 900 was based on, I just, 3% is what I applied. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and to, to be frank about it, I, I, I hate that it's that little given where the economy is right now, but when you look at the CPI index at the beginning of the year versus where it is now, there's quite a difference. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, I really wish we could have done more, but in order to, to stay consistent with the formulas we previously used to calculate uh, increases, that's where we are. Yeah. Mr. McCann? Sorry, that was from the previous comment. Oh, okay. Okay. Very good. Any other questions? Comments? All right. If not, we'll do a roll call vote to accept the solid waste management uh, special operating budget. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor McKen? Yes. Councillor Deckard is not present. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Councillor Spoonmore? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Wilts? Yes. Motion passed unanimously six to zero. Thank you. Council, I uh, move to open for discussion and review fund 8283 solid waste management debt service with zero um, allocated in personnel, supplies and capital and $305,920 in the services category for a total budget of $305,920. Second. All right, Mr. McGlasson. Uh, yeah, this is uh, you know the, the the debt related to the bond um, that bond that was issued uh, for the closure of the landfill uh, back in two thousand and seven, and uh, you know based on the amortization table um, for that bond and uh, those those numbers have been reviewed and approved by DLGF. Very good. Uh, do we have any questions? 
on this budget. Any comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll uh, do a roll call vote to accept the Solid Waste Management District's uh, debt service budget. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor Deckard is not present. Councilor Wilkes? Yes. Councilor McKem? Yes. Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor Spoonmore? Yes. Motion passed unanimously six to zero. Council, I move to open for discussion and review fund 1215 solid waste management capital non-reverting with $0 budgeted across all the categories for a total budget of $0. Second. All right, this one's easy. Is anybody insisting that we add money to this budget? <laughs> right? <laughs> I have a question. All right, any questions or comments? Yeah, Ms. Ms. Hawk. Sorry, I asked a question. Um, okay, so is there any cash left in there? Uh, it says non-reverting, but I think that's really uh, should just there, go right back into your general and be done with it. Oh, but there, there, there is about forty-five thousand dollars in there, I believe. Uh, Ms. Martin, do you have that number handy? <laughs> um, the reason I question that is I don't think there was ever. Uh, this was ever set up as a certain percent for what would be a non-reverting capital. Um, so they either have to, it seems to me, uh, put one in place so that it's legitimately in there. Uh, because I really believe what, what this was intended years ago was sort of a, a savings, kind of almost a rainy day. Um, so I'm not sure it was ever done officially. I think the balance is 45,413, something like that. Whatever, that's just my thoughts on it. Thanks. Well, I mean, and you know, it would be, be, be at my board's pleasure. Uh, you know, they could, they could certainly consider that. Um, you know, a little, little history, you know, the, the cumulative capital fund is uh, something that was established uh, by the previous director um, in 2012 or 13, I believe, um, when the district was considering uh, pursuing its own materials recovery facility. Um, th that ultimately did not happen. And so there were not, no actions were taken, um, you know, to do annual funding for this fund, to contribute money to it uh, each year. Um, nor have we ever looked at it as a potential source for major projects because uh, we don't have any major projects planned for down the road at this time. Um, uh, but but it's there um, and in, in previous discussions that, that we've had through budget cycles with DLGF, uh, it was recommended to us by DLGF that even if we don't plan to contribute or spend money that we go ahead and submit the zero capital fund budget for adoption so that in the event something were to happen during the year uh, and, and, and we needed to tap into that fund to repair part of a building or something like that, uh, we have the adopted budget on record that we can seek an additional appropriation from. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. Seeing none, can we have a roll call vote to accept the Solid Waste Management's capital non-reverting budget? Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Spoonmore? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Deckard is not present still. Councillor Wiltz? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Councillor McKen? Yes. Motion passed unanimously six to zero. Good. All right, have a good evening. Thank you all. Thank you. And uh, next up is our, uh, our first department uh, for review, and that will be our clerk's office. Welcome to Monroe County Clerk Nicole Brown, who's joining us. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Great. Good evening, members of the council with my continued hope that all of you and your families are safe and well during these uncertain times. 
It is a privilege to present the budget for an office with an incredibly hardworking and dedicated staff who show up and go above and beyond for Monroe County residents and visitors to the community wishing to access clerk and court services. Yet our deputy clerks continue to fall disproportionately so behind their court reporter counterparts with respect to their wages. And my 91 clerk brothers and sisters have freely shared similar concerns about their offices. During these times, patrons who come into the clerk's office present with more social services needs and mental health issues than my office is trained to provide. They are increasingly combative and aggressive. Speaking of boots on the ground, the phrase used by Chief Dillard earlier tonight, council members of PAC may recall reclassification efforts indicative of the fact that my staff have parallel yet equal responsibilities to their court reporter counterparts, but with the added component of having to assist this increasingly stressed patronage. I'm told this is what initiated the request for an overall reassessment of Monroe County government positions with WIS. Following their findings, I continue to struggle with concerns about the evaluations that came back from that recent WIS assessment, and I want to keep this issue on your radar for memorialization and historical record purposes. With respect to the clerk budget, to the extent possible, we've tried to keep our request as close to last year as we could. The amount of the request in the overtime line may be of concern to you. By way of an explanation, the policy decision to cap how many compensatory hours can be accrued by a county employee dealt a significant blow to my office in that when we cannot recruit an adequate number of early and absentee workers, we are left with very few options, but to pull some of the clerk staff from the Justice Building down to Election Central to supplement the people we are actually able to recruit. I'd previously been able to offer my employees comp time to supplement other benefit time and perhaps a little bit of overtime with what we didn't expend during Little 500 weekend. To date, given that we neither had elections nor Little Five weekend in 2021, there was little need to spend from that line. However, with a closer to, re to normal return of staff and the return of IU students to in-person and on-campus learning, as other justice building offices, such as the prosecutor and the sheriff have an increase in their case volume, this does impact directly impact my office and will only ramp up exponenti exponentially as we go into the new year and prepare for the 2022 election. Other increases reflect vendor increases for services that have simply been passed along to the clerk. And with that, I would welcome any questions you have about the clerk's budget at this time. So first, I think I'll, I'll make a, a motion. Um, so council, I'm, I move to open for discussion and review fund 1000-0001 general fund clerk with 1,909,331 dollars in the personnel category, $35,000 in supplies, $182,240 dollars in services, and zero in capital for a total budget of $2,126,571 dollars. Second. Okay, so we just had a, uh, uh, some remarks there from Clerk Brown. Um, let's see if we have any initial questions or discussion on the, the clerk's general fund budget based on what we've heard so far. My apologies, counselor. I am a little nervous. Yeah. No, no worries. No worries. Yeah, it looks like uh, Mr. Iverson, uh, you have the floor now, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. It, I, I first wanted to look at, um, Deputy number five, it appears there might be a Scribner's error there. It looks like that person is receiving a $1 increase over last year. It, it appears to be a formula rounding versus the uh, hard-coded number in the cell. That is correct. We, we have discovered that with rounding, just using the plain round, either up or down, that departments at the end of the year were having to transfer 30 cents, 15 cents, that kind of thing in order to complete a uh, employee's salary. So we decided to round up um, to uh, the nearest dollar 
to keep departments from having to make at the year end these very nominal uh, transfers. That makes a lot of sense to me. And it's good to hear that, you know, someone's not receiving just $1 of an increase. That would be a little something. Uh, may I ask another question, Mr. President? Yes. yes. Uh, Clerk Brown, I really appreciate uh, you coming before us tonight and appreciate everything you do. We are just so appreciative. We're able to hold uh, elections in this county that uh, are, are looked at by others as, as, uh, as just really a, a gold standard. So really appreciate all the work that you and your staff do, and I wanted to make sure that I uh, was able to say that publicly. Um, and and uh, you know, I, I guess my my comment is is that as I hold uh, you know listing sessions and hear from constituents, um, that that overtime line is something that I'm hearing about as well. Is trying to make sure that we have uh, you know enough people to be able to continue to offer the level of you know of, of elections that that Mineral County residents are accustomed to. So. Um, I, I appreciate a little bit uh, uh, of your explanation in the, in the side there and you spending some time talking about that tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Iverson. Now, please don't make me get emotional. My chief deputy doesn't like that. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think she can handle whatever uh, the council can throw at you tonight. All right. Any other questions or uh, comments from Council for the general fund budget. Uh, is that Ms. Munson? Was that your hand? Yes. Yes, Clerk Brown, thank you. I have a question on line um, <clears throat> 30006, contractual, uh, which is a, um, a substantial increase. Can you uh, talk to us about that? Absolutely. I um, just quite simply, um, vendor fees have gone up as far as the services that mm -hmm. we utilize them for. And the only thing that makes sense to me um, would be that they are trying to make earn revenue that they did not get during a significant portion of last year, you know, during the pandemic last year that our fees have mm -hmm. gone up and not down. Right. <clears throat> so I see the amount is similar to the actuals for 2019 and 2020, <clears throat> but just substantially more than 2021. So, but comparable so to 2018. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I, I had a, uh, I took note here when, when I heard that um, your employees are being subjected to uh, combative individuals. I think that was the, the terminology. I, could you kind of explain that a little bit more? And then what are, what are some possible solutions that could be put in place for that? So um, thank you, Councillor Spoonmore. Um, and this has been, going on and I'm going to put one of my old hats on. I used to work for the Department of Correction at a different time in, in my life and um, there a significant amount of change has happened over the years. It, it was the case that there was a lot more money in mental health services within the state. Um, then when they started taking that money out of the state budgets, a lot of times um, people who committed, I worked for the Department of Correction, people who committed offenses, instead of receiving services, they were being thrown into um, the department, of, the system in the Department of Correction. I think on some level that's also kind of happening now. Um, there's not a lot of services and the ones that are in Monroe County are stressed because we do what we do so well here in Monroe County my understanding is busloads of people are being dropped off, just left here in Monroe County because we do provide services. Well, bringing that around to, this is a public building. Uh, people, if, if they don't know what else to do, they wanna get their, their day in court. Many times um, they are wishing to access the courts for things that are not, um, 
not something that the court could probably handle. They file, for lack of a better term, I want to apologize in advance, frivolous cases that we then we can't refuse them. We have to offer them services. But um, if we we find people staying in here longer than um, would be allowed for the services we can provide, I want the uh, viewing public to understand that we cannot um, give any kind of legal advice. So we're not able to lead and guide you. We just help you get your day in court. And when we take that paperwork, we turn it over and everything else is decided by the judge. And so um, I'm not here to make disparaging remarks. I value every single part of the system within here, with, here within the justice building, but my colleagues' counterparts are behind locked doors and in judges' chambers, or when they're in court, they have a dedicated bailiff um, who can kind of keep um, extreme behaviors out of the office. We have to trust that the staff that is the bailiff and security staff at the front door, we can only pull them in if they're not on the door assisting somebody else. There's got to be coverage for the people who are coming in, making sure they're not bringing weapons into the building. And so um, if you're asking me for solutions, um, certainly I try to use training money to get my staff um, even virtual training for how to deal with combative patrons. Uh, I'm open to other suggestions, uh, but the bottom line is, as I've said many times, my people are underpaid for doing as much or more than their counterparts who don't have to deal with the public in the way that we do. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or uh or discussion on the clerk's general fund budget. All right. Uh, if there are not, we will take a roll call vote to accept the clerk's general fund budget. Councilor Wilkes? Yes. Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. Councilor Spinmore? Yes. Councilor Deckard is not present. Motion passes unanimously six to zero. And uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Wiltz, uh, just to kind of go back to that previous discussion um, for the clerk, I'm, I, I want the clerk's office and, and the clerk herself to know I'm very sensitive to uh, keeping employees safe uh, and secure, uh, you know, particularly in government buildings, we've seen some alarming incidents uh, in the not too uh, recent past. And uh, so I think this is something we need to be keeping an eye on and, and please do keep us uh, aware of these sorts of things so that we can uh, work to some, uh, to solutions that will keep people safe if, if that is, is, if they're at risk of, of any danger there. So I just want to- I appreciate that. And certainly my, my staff understands that um, to reach out to the bailiff and security services. Um, I have arranged for active shooter training for the people in both um, at both the Justice, Build, the Justice Building and Election Central. Um, I made an effort a couple of years back to um, request bulletproof glass for the doors um, in the event of an active shooter. I was told I did not need bulletproof glass for my doors, I would uh, humbly disagree. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for that information. We'll continue to, to, to have those conversations. Um, okay. So let's uh, move on now uh, to our next budget. Uh, Council, I move to open for discussion and review fund 1119-0000, Clerk's Perpetuation with $69,716 in personnel, $2,000 in supplies, $50,500 in services, zero in capital, for a total budget of $122,216. Second. All right. Ms. Brown. Okay, I'm, I'm a little calmer this time. The Clerk's Perpetuation Fund is a revenue-driven fund that has increasingly dwindled over the years due to more records being accessed electronically. 
However, it is a fund that we continue to monitor carefully and out of which we pay to employees and expenses related to maintaining clerk records. Um, unless you have clarifying questions, this is um, a task we will continue to do and continue to monitor carefully, and I have nothing further with respect to this budget. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. It looks like uh, Ms. Hawk has a question or a comment. Well, a, a comment uh, because we've been uh, we've been watching the the dollar amounts being uh, reduced going into that fund, and so whatever budget we approve uh, at the end of the day, it it's just like any other fund. You, you may have the uh, appropriation, but you've got to have the cash before you spend it. And so I know they'll be watching, and if it looks like so that cash isn't coming in. They just have to quit spending out of that fund. And, and I Madam think, Kelly, go ahead. I think that's as you understand it, correct? Madam Counselor, of course, um, I believe that um, this is an issue we visited in the past where the first year that I was clerk, I did not have a full grasp and understanding of the perpetuation fund. You have had no negative balances in the clerk's perpetuation perpetuation fund that time and I promise you that my team and I watched that as close as anybody else. Thank you. Oh I know I know you do. I wanted to just make sure that you understood uh, and that the public understands uh, where we're going on this and the fact that, that it is one you have to watch all the time and I know that you do. So I thank you for that. Okay, any uh, additional questions or comments on the clerk's perpetuation fund? And seeing none, Ms. Miller will have a roll call vote to accept this budget. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Councillor Wiltz? Yes. Councillor Deckard is not present. Councillor Spoonmore? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Iverson. Yes. Motion passed unanimously six to zero. Council, I move to open for discussion and review fund 1215-0010, election fund voter registration with $137,433 in personnel, 3,000 in supplies, $34,100 in services, zero in capital for a total budget of $174,533. Second. All right. Clerk Brown, take it away on the election budget. <laughs> uh, thank you, Commissioner Spumore. With respect to voter registration, the increases in our voter registration budget include an increase in the TINs to accommodate the cost of living adjustment you offered last year for part-time employees to a minimum of $14 per hour. We've kept our 20s in the line at the same amount that we requested last year. In the 30s, we've requested an increase in printing and subscriptions for anticipated notification to voters as a result of voting changes in conjunction with the census and re-precincting, as well as an anticipated countywide mailing following any changes due to redistricting or annexation. It is anticipated that this countywide mailing will likely involve the assistance of a trusted vendor with helping us to get out that mass mailing. And additionally, the United States Postal Service has recently implemented a rate increase in postage. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll see if we have any questions or comments for you. Um, Councilor Hawk, yes. Uh, what you were just discussing, is that the, the on the contractual line where, where it's going from 6,000 to 15,000? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I don't, uh, I have none myself. So um, we will uh, do a roll call vote to accept the election budget. And I'm, so, I'm sorry. Voter registration. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is voter registration. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Spoonmore? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Wiltz? Yes. 
Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Deckard is not present. Motion passed unanimously six to zero. Council, I move to open for discussion and review. Fund 1215-0062, Election Fund Election Board. Personnel category budgeted at $538,245, supplies at $100,000, services at $537,000, capital zero for a total budget of $1,175,245. Second. All right, and Clerk Brown, I always love to hear from our wonderful election board representatives. Do we have uh, anyone joining you tonight that we should get uh, uh, added as a presenter on this? Indeed, if I could ask you or trouble you to upgrade um, election board members, Hal Turner and Shruti Rana, they are listed as attendees currently. Thank you. Absolutely. And welcome uh, to our election board members. Mr. Turner and Ms. Rana. All right, it looks like we have everybody here. So feel free to, uh, to present when you're ready. Thank you. As the council might imagine, this year's election budget looks different than the 2018 budget request as a result of a change in projection for anticipated election needs. Previously, we based our budget request on comparable county elections, and we allowed for some uptick, in it, but pretty much stayed with comparable voter turnout, um, an average of that for county elections. I'm sure you'll recall that 2018 presented us with a voter turnout in numbers that hadn't been seen since 1912. For the viewing audience, I'd like to put the council in remembrance that the same number of voters eligible to vote in a presidential election cycle are eligible to vote in a county election cycle. This means that any registered Monroe County voter can vote in 2022. And thus we are preparing as though it were a presidential election season to accommodate an increase in that voter turnout. However, I'd like to point out that during last year's presidential primary, when we didn't know what we didn't know about the pandemic, we scale back to seven polling sites to try and curtail the number of voters accessing the polling site. For the general, once we had updated, we had updated and better guidance from the CDC, we returned to the regular 34 polling sites, which includes some super precincts and to the largest HAVA and ADA compliant locations we could find in Monroe County. And we will do the same thing for 2022, which also calls for, as you know, double the manpower in the form of bipartisan teams for each of those 34 polling sites. I'd also like to put the council in remembrance that with this rolling election fund, what goes unused will roll back into the election fund. I do have the best election board this side of heaven on tonight's call with me, and I'm sure they join me in welcoming any questions you may have regarding the election budget at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that information. We'll see if we have any questions or, uh, or comments here from council members. If so, uh, yes, Mr. McKinnon. I, I swear, I think I ask this question every year and I always forget the answer, or at least I think I forget the answer, but the voting machine custodians, is that the IT support for early voting and election day or what, what exactly is that? Indeed, that is our, uh, that is Bob, who we cannot get through elections without his team, b and um, I'll put the council in remembrance that we used to have IVD, Indiana Voice and Data, and um, we kind of stole Bob from them, honestly, um, because he offered us um, a better, better bang for our buck although it's still, particularly with respect to election integrity, um, it is still cost, but we have roving teams on election day. Uh, we used to use a volunteer uh, service through the Rotary Club to deliver our election equipment, pick it back up and bring it to us. Now our IT people do that because they're as vested in our uh, very expensive election equipment as we all are. And so that is our IT team. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any other questions or comments? Uh, Councillor Hawk. Uh, yes. Uh, in the past, a few years ago, I live in the past, I know that, uh, many people would sign up to work on election day because, oh, they had such a great time. Everybody had wonderful food. It was like a celebration time, you know? Uh, and so I bet I noticed the meal uh, amount. Is it is it going to be those box meals again? Or are we way past the time when people used to bring in wonderful homemade meals? Councillor Hawk, the kindest thing that I can say is that the party is over. And what we do is, um, and it, it particularly worked well during COVID, but I can't take credit for it. It, it um, began under the previous administration. We began issuing a stipend. So um, certainly uh, teams are encouraged to work together to bring meals um, and celebrate um, all they like. <laughs> um, but what we do is just give them a flat stipend for the day in addition to their pay to Re reimburse them for whatever they expended for their food for the day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Iverson. Yeah, as it pertains to the party being over, that is to say, we're not feeding everybody anymore, which I kind of would be interested. I've never seen that. Um, what, it, it, you know, in the COVID environment, how are we going to be doing elections as a lot of the poll workers tended to be older? And we know that this uh, Delta variant is, is especially uh, dangerous to, to that, that population. Thank you, Commissioner Iverson. First, thank you for the uh, space and grace to give a shout out to my poll workers. Um, I could get emotional about that too, uh, because yes, we do have a lot of um, seasoned and veteran um, poll workers. Um, and, and that tends to be, you know, we're asking these people, particularly during early voting and election, to give up time out of their lives when most of us have to return to, to our jobs. Um, I was pleasantly surprised during the 2020 presidential elections to see so many of my veteran poll workers take a chance and come out. They put their PPE on um, and they came out. And when I, I try to go every... Um, to every training and greet them and thank them because we can't do what we do without them. To, I, I don't want to practice medicine without a license. Certainly uh, the variables that are coming out with respect to COVID are no joke. And at this time, I can't uh, give you a projection on what will happen with our poll workers, but we value them, we appreciate them, we do everything that we can and we'll continue to, to make sure that they are safe, that my employees are safe, and that our voters are safe. I'm hoping that it will be just as amazing in 2022 as it was in 2020. Thank you. All right, Mr. McKim. Yeah, so I noticed that your uh, equipment line is zero. So I guess my, my two questions are, are the quantities of equipment that we, we have already purchased adequate to conducting this election, in your opinion, in the opinion of the election board? And then also, I, I assume we have uh, maintenance contracts that are probably shown on one of the services lines to, uh, to essentially provide service and warranty support if any of the equipment should fail. It comes out of contractual counselor. The maintenance agreement comes out of contractual. Thank you. And then, and then what about the uh, adequacy of the number of pieces of equipment? So at, we did um, order slightly more than what we needed in terms of making sure that if something broke down, we had the ability to replace it. I certainly have no reason to believe that we won't be able to meet our election needs um, as we were able to do with a full out election back in November. Um, but certainly if the circumstances should change and we need more, I'm not too proud to come back and ask for that on behalf of Monroe County voters. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Munson. Clerk Brown, I noticed that uh, most of the <clears throat> election staff uh, are uh, 
sharply increased over 20, over 2020. And would you like to uh, tell us more about this, please? So um, I want to, this offers me an opportunity to thank you, Councillor Munson, because when you raised those rates to $14 per hour, you included um, my poll worker and election staff. And so um, that increase is reflected of that increase in wages. And my poll workers, I'm sure, join me in expressing extreme gratitude for your recognizing that they were underpaid and continue to be underpaid for the services that we ask of them uh, during early voting and election. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councilor Wilts. Um, thank you, Clerk Brown, um, for a great uh, detailed presentation on your uh, priorities. I, um, I had a question and then I got so interested in looking at this other stuff. I keep looking away, I apologize, because I've got my big screen over here where I'm, I've got the budget blown up so I can actually see it. Um, but I would, since the election board members are here, I would love to hear from them directly on what, um, perhaps what their biggest concerns or um, are regarding um, managing the elections and um, any, I don't know, anything else you'd like to, to share with us relative to the budget? Certainly. Um, if, if I could go first, uh, Shruti, is that okay? Okay. The, uh, the, election, um, the election board, I think, um, had an interesting year last year um, in dealing with COVID. Um, we, uh, of course, are already thinking about how we can maintain the safety of our staff We have an, uh, and volunteers. We have a number of older volunteers, uh, which you've recognized. The state has given us the ability uh, to be a little more flexible in bringing in younger workers. And we will have an effort to do that, to get the word out early, uh, to get them trained properly, and to hopefully start within that age group a tradition of working the elections uh, so we can maintain a, a safe, uh, stable, and competent workforce. We had a, a tremendous surge of voters last year, and there's no reason to believe that will not happen again. We were processing one voter every 45 seconds during early voting. Um, yeah, wow is right. Um, it, uh, it only stands to reason that we have to be prepared to handle at least that much in coming elections. We will continue to recruit vigorously to bring in qualified people. Um, we actually um, never had a surplus of people, but we always had people who were qualified enough to be able to flex where they were needed. Uh, that's not the, the right way to run an election, especially when we are challenged, not just with safety, but with the security of the ballots, the security of the voting process, and uh, the security of, of the voters themselves too. Uh, these are perilous times and we wanna make sure that um, we get an early start on all of these challenges. It is my intent and I think I, I can speak for my colleague who will speak to you now, that um, we will do everything possible to make sure that the vote is safe and secure and that it is as efficient as we can possibly make it with the number of volunteers we have. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Well, thank you also for the opportunity to speak. And I also just wanna thank Clerk Brown for her leadership on all of this. Um, I fully support everything that Mr. Turner has brought up and we are just really focused on, you know, as he mentioned, 
voter safety, security, the integrity of the ballot, and also making sure that voters have the most convenient access to polling locations, um, and also, um, you know, that we can support um, the high turnout that we expect, as well as address these challenges that are constantly evolving and unknown with respect to the pandemic, um, as well as the intersection of um, safety and, um, and security. So um, I think really with the resources available, the um, clerk's office and the board has done a really tremendous job um, and the poll workers, I second everything that people have said, they've just been out there and volunteering for more. Um, so I think we're lucky to have the community that, that we do and um, want to continue to support um, expanding access as much as possible. Thank you. Um, I did remember my question, if I could, um, President Spinmore. Um, I, I was wondering, um, I know that it was brought up about the efforts to um, it involve younger folks, the high school aged folks in particular, um, with being, um, with working at the polls. And um, I'm wondering, first of all, how much success you saw with that and if you you have been working at all with the actual the teachers to incorporate it into curriculum um, because I do see an opportunity there I know that um, my daughter was involved with extracurricular activities you know the the high school Dems and the high school Republican groups were um, contacted but have we looked at possible coordinating with classes so, so I'm sorry, Mr. Hal, go ahead. No, no, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, but it, it, um, it would be a great opportunity for us to go into the high schools and be able to speak to some of these potential candidates to work the election. Uh, we have at times gone in, into the university to speak to classes there uh, about what we do and how we do it. So um, that is certainly an open possibility. And I think it would be uh, a, a tremendous boon to these students if, if we were allowed to come in and, and do the uh, presentations uh, to explain what we do, why we do it, and, and the importance of doing that for uh, our kind of government. Yeah. Um, Councillor Wilt, I almost upgraded you to a commissioner. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> Councillor Wilt, um, pre in previous incarnations of the election board, we actually did go into the high schools um, and talk to them about elections. I even uh, made a shameless plug for the fact that we, of course, pay our poll workers. There are no volunteers on election day. Um, and so we do get some mixture of high school, college, and veteran poll workers. And it has worked out really nicely, but um, young people do have things to do. We did at that age as well. We uh, tend to have a lot of uh, dropouts within a week to a few days before the election. And so a lot of times it's our younger people um, who may have found uh, a better agenda than what I'm able to offer for such a long day on election day. Got it. Thank you. Um, so I've, I've got a, a couple of questions here, uh, particularly with the, um, with the election pay. Have we, has there been any data collected um, around other counties to see what others are paying their election workers and if we're being competitive in that regard. I know it's, it's kind of hard to, um, to compete with other counties for election workers because that doesn't really happen, but are, are, we, are we staying in the, you know, at the market rate, I guess? That's an excellent question, Commissioner Spumore. And here's, here's what I'll tell you, just the all 92 clerks tend to, there's mass emails that come out all the time about different um, topics. And one that came out recently was um, that some trained poll workers look at those rates 
And so say um, around Marion County, Marion County pays the best. Um, and so a surrounding county poll worker will go and take their talents to Marion County and nothing against my mentor, Clerk Eldridge, um, but they do that. We do very well for this area, surrounding counties. Um, you know, I don't, well, I don't have anybody from a surrounding county, but I, I do see what the surrounding counties pay and we are doing pretty well. But honestly, that's thanks to a couple of things. First, my coming before you all, um, a couple of years back to request an increase when we realized that they were making significantly less than minimum wage, and then your own generosity in um, allowing that $14 per hour to apply to my poll workers. And then so some of those day rates, our, our um, election teams that have day rates, those went up as well. So. Um, it, I certainly do plan to approach you again, but you know I, I'm trying to settle right now. We we're going through a pandemic, um, but to get though to continue to make it a um, uh, oh I'm, I apologize for losing my word a desirable opportunity to be of service to the community. Thank you. Yeah, and and I appreciate that. And please again, yeah, keep us keep us posted on these, and let's continue these conversations for sure. Um, and I'm also wondering, do we have any provision that allows for, on election day, part-time workers? Because I, I feel like, and I, and I hear that, um, you know, it's a grueling day when you're working at the polls. You get there at like 5.30 in the morning, and then you're there until 7 p.m. or something in the afternoon, like an hour after polls close. And then some of them have to go back to Election Central for another hour to wait in line and get everything uh, submitted and tabulate. I mean, for a lot of people, uh, even, you know, pretty young, energetic people, that can still be a very grueling day when you're dealing with that many people. And I think that's a big part of what keeps people from, from wanting to, uh, uh, to serve in that capacity. Is there anything that the state is doing or that we are allowed to do to kind of compensate for that? Or um, maybe that's the wrong word <laughs> to, uh, uh, to alleviate that, uh, that just the, the lengthy day. I mean, 12, 13, 14 hour work days are tough. Thank you, Commissioner. I almost upgraded you too. <laughs> Councilor Spoonmore, um, this is something that comes up with every election cycle. And yes, it is possible to serve a half day. Here's the issue, uh, Councilor Spoonmore. I am so sorry, I'm tired. Uh, Councilor Spoonmore, um, the problem is, is that we get people who are up and energized and ready to do their service on election day. And then we have somebody who is scheduled to come in and do the afternoon and evening, um, and then they back out. And okay. so we, we tried to recruit that in a number of different ways, basically saying, you know, thank you if you're willing to work a half day. Do you have a buddy who can take over when you're done? Um, and we have genuinely tried. This is something all 92 of our, the clerks experience is you just can't get anybody to come that second half of the day. It usually doesn't work the other way where they want to come in in the afternoon, and, you know, and, and take off the morning. And so, like you said, by the end of the day, it is it has been a long day. So we have people who don't want to continue on into the night, but it does, it is a process to get everybody back from the polls, get their materials checked in so that we can get to counting um, those ballots and get you those results. And so uh, I advertise for it, I welcome it, but, I would prefer the buddy system so that we're not left shorthanded. I'm okay. hopeful I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And then finally, um, has the election board taken any official vote together on this budget uh, at any of your meetings? And was it unanimous in, in, in their approval of it? Yes, uh, we reviewed the budget and it was unanimously agreed uh, that uh, Clerk Brown, present this budget to you tonight. Great. Okay. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to support this. I think, you know, anytime you look at, these are some pretty eye-popping numbers for, for elections. And I, I, I know that's just, 
what we have to do though uh, to um, uh, to execute uh, great elections. Uh, and we do it better than anybody in the state of Indiana, I think. And so I am so appreciative of all of the work that our election workers do, uh, all of the work of our election board and our clerk and all of the staff over there. Uh, this is not easy to pull off. And there is a ton of responsibility and accountability associated with these elections. And, um, you know, I'm just very grateful that we're able to do it so well. So thank you. And I, I absolutely support your budget. And we need to make sure that you have the resources you need to continue to execute well. Um, Councilor Schoolmore, if I could just encourage you to reiterate um, something that you all talked about earlier. I don't want anyone watching tonight to think that we have not been fiscally responsible. So if you wouldn't mind to explain about the rolling budget and the levy, um, I'd be very grateful. Oh, and Mr. McKim may want to weigh in as well, too. So I, I think you're talking about the operating balance of the election fund. Was it minus 3% compared? Was that what, when Mr. McKim was presenting some information earlier? Yes. He said that there was not enough money in the fund and we return any unspent money to that fund. And I don't want anyone listening or viewing to walk away with the impression that we were not fiscally responsible. No, that's not what happened. No, no. And, and what we would need to do, and I think as Mr. Kemp kind of stated earlier, is we're just gonna have to look at some of the levy amount and move that around uh, through, through the various funds. And we have that ability to do that. We absolutely will. Um, it's a, we've, we've, the general fund has some levy that we can move and I, that's probably the, you know, the area we'd want to look at first uh, to cover uh, the election expenses. Well, can I just follow up on that a little bit? This, sure. this came, came about really because the auditor made kind of a policy decision this last year to not accumulate excess funds in any of the other funds in the frozen levy other than the general fund with the idea that some of their fund balances were growing too large. And so the auditors recommend, re recommended levies were significantly reduced for many of the non-general funds so that all those excess levies would uh, accumulate in the general fund. And that's just something we have to rebalance every year. That, that's not, that really doesn't have anything to do with the department's budgeting process or not being fiscally responsible or anything. That is just simply a cash management decision that the council and only the council really needs to make at the end of the year on the recommendations of the, of the auditor. Can I, can I just say something to that effect? Sure. The, uh, someone had asked if, uh, because we, we are, you know, trying to build this fund so that um, it does cover the next uh, cycle. And so what I wanted to, to let everyone know is currently there is a cash balance of 1.4 million in the election fund. They have an outstanding um, unexpended balance of $200 and $8,000. So if they spent everything that they have budgeted for in the election fund for 2021, they will end the year with cash as of right this moment at 1.2 million, which will cover their 2022 requests. So I do believe we are um, looking at those and Auditor Smith, you know, like she, um, was moving, you know, the levies and making sure. So we are ensuring that we have a balance for the following year in this fund to cover the expenses that is needed. Uh, thanks, Thank Michelle. You, uh, you can Council hear Hall. how it sounds, right? Yeah, and I just want to hope, hopefully that gives you some reassurance that um, that everything's all good. Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay. President Spoonmore, if I could just say a word. Um, I came into the election board on the uh, riding the wave of COVID and on the cusp of a presidential election year. 
Um, I probably couldn't have seen a tougher year for uh, for um, Clerk uh, Brown's staff than I saw last year, and I was blown away. Uh, they were extraordinary in the work they did, and um, Clerk Brown was there to make sure that that all the loose ends were tied up, if there were any, and there were very few. Um, so I, um, I wholeheartedly support uh, what she is advocating for the budget this year. Uh, I, I, if I were hiring a, an election staff, these are the people I would hire without question. That's great, great to hear. Thank you for that perspective. Okay, uh, did Ms. Hawk, did you have a, a question or a comment? That doesn't appear that she's with us right now. Um, okay, well that, uh, Michelle, was there anything else that you had to add? You, you still have your hand up? Okay, so I think that uh, if there's nothing else from council, uh, we'll do a roll call vote to accept the election board budget. Megan had to step away for a moment, so I'm gonna take care of it for her. Got it. Okay. Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Deckard? Still not present. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Not present. Councillor Wiltz? Yes. Councillor Spoonmore? Yes. Motion passed, unanimous five to zero. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us again tonight. Have a good evening. Thank you. I appreciate your help. Thank you. Okay, and that will conclude all of the budgets uh, for the clerk's office.